You're watching LMCC. I'm standing at the end of a driveway of a home that just recently had a fire. Normally, the people that live in the home are standing at the end of the driveway with me, watching the firefighters fight the fire. The intent of today's segment, After the Fire, is to motivate you, our viewers, to know more about fire prevention so you can prevent this tragedy from happening in your home. Now, firefighters fight fires, but fire educators have to fight complacency. People think, this isn't gonna happen to me. It's never gonna happen in my neighborhood. This will happen to other people. They tell themselves, the fire station's across the street, fire hydrant's just down the road. I know a firefighter on the block. This stuff will not prevent a fire in your home. You have to know about fire prevention. Do you know how your fire department operates? Is it full time? Is it paid on call? Is it volunteer? How do they respond to fires? When the fire district has a fire and we deem it's safe for people to go back in, I try to prepare the people that live there for what they're gonna see when they walk in. The images they have in their head, and most people have in their head, are usually from TV and movies, and that's just not reality. Usually they're devastated, overwhelmed, and shocked by what they see. Let's go check it out. Here we are inside with Mike Lindstrom from Lindstrom Restoration, and today we are gonna show you what a house looks like after a fire. Absolutely, it's good to be here, Kelly. So let's talk about what, where we're standing and what we're looking at. Yeah, well, we're here inside the entryway to the home. It's a split level, kind of built between 1978 and 1980. And we see this a lot where there's some, there's some lines here and marks with the soot. And what are we looking at, Kelly? So a lot of people don't realize that um, a, in a fire, the hot black icky smoke goes up. When you're sitting at a campfire or in front of your fireplace, that fire goes up into the sky, it goes up into the chimney. And it's not usually hot black icky smoke because you're burning wood. But when you're in a home and you have fire, all the contents are creating this soot, this blackness that goes up and fills the room up. And what you're looking here is at the soot, how it's coming down. Now, this line here where the drippings are is where the firefighters came in with their fire hose, hit that hot, black, icky smoke, and steam was created, which is causing the dripping marks that you see here. But down below, you see this clearer space. This is when we talk about crawling low under smoke because this is where the cool clean air that's in the room remains and that's how you can get out safely. So it's cool down here and almost up to 1500 degrees up here. So I'm six foot two mm -hmm. and if I was in this home during this fire basically the smoke would be here at my hips. Yeah, but you would be crawling low. I'd be crawling that's low. That's why we crawl low under the smoke. Sure. So we can get out and stay out. Okay Kelly, so here we are in the kitchen. You know, what are some, some top three things that homeowners and, and citizens in the area should be worried about with fire? And then also, what are some things that basically everybody could do in their own kitchen, in their own home to either, you know, put out a fire or prevent a fire? Okay, so the top um, causes of home fires in the state of Minnesota are cooking, um, open flame, and heating. So let's talk about cooking fires. Most of the cooking fires in Minnesota occur on top of the stovetop and it's because people are walking away from the stovetop. We call it unattended cooking. And for whatever reason, they're answering the door. Their kids. Checking on the kids, going to see why the dog's barking, you know, ordering wreaths from the scouts. For some reason, they're walking out of the kitchen. We've actually even had people that have been standing in their kitchen, texting, social media, doing something, and the fire actually occurs right before them. Um, so a lot of people, when they come in and they see a pot on fire in the stove because they've, you know, been at the door talking to the neighbor. Sure, we're going to get some water over here, right? Right. And um, we've been taught our whole lives, put water on fire. Sure. So when we're in a panic situation, what are we going to do? We're going to panic and go, I've got to put water on this. Well, you can't do that on a stovetop because you could be cooking bratwurst, frying french fries, making hamburgers. So what you want to do is take the lid of the pan, okay? And you actually want to treat that like a shield to protect yourself from that flame. And you just want to slowly slide the lid over and turn off the heat source. Now we tell people you want to leave it, you know, overnight or till that next evening. You just want to leave it on the stovetop for an extended amount of time because it will flare back up if you uh, take the lid off. Now, if you don't have a lid, you know, grab that 
baking dish, put it over. Grab that cookie sheet or pizza pan, put it over. Turn off that heat. It's as simple as that. Now when it comes to open flame, um, most of those are candles that are unattended or put in the wrong place. So I tell people, you know, treat your candle like a toddler. Would you leave a toddler alone in a room? No, you shouldn't leave a candle alone in a room. You should blow it out before you leave. And also, it can't be around curtains, underneath cupboards. Sure. It's got to be somewhere where that flame, that heat from that flame isn't going to spread and start a fire. And then the other one is heating. And that can be because you haven't had your fireplace checked or inspected. Um, which you should do on a regular basis, or they're putting their space heaters too close to combustibles like couches, beds, curtains. Sure, three feet or more, right? Yeah, three feet or more, okay. very good. Yeah, so that's, that's the three things that um, we want people to pay attention to so they can prevent this tragedy from happening in their home. Okay, Kelly, so here we are in the hallway. We're just outside the kitchen, the entryway's over there, and I believe the fire came through the window in this bedroom and then worked its way down the home this way. So we're seeing ceilings are down, there's holes in the wall here. Kind of what, what happened here? Was this from the fire or is this from something else? Okay, so after the firefighters come in and put out the fire, we still have to make sure it hasn't spread. So what you're looking at is firefighters have to pull ceilings to make sure it didn't get into the attic. Behind you, we had to pull the wall apart to make sure it's not in the walls. And even when you look at the door trim and the trim on the doors, we usually have to pull that off to make sure the fire didn't get behind the trim or get anywhere. Okay. So that's why the insul insulation's on the floor. And what people don't realize is that even if the fire's out, we still have to come and look for it, make sure it hasn't spread. And then we have to use water for hot spots. So we're bringing more, even more water into the home. Now, fire, we talked a little bit about fire behavior and how the um, hot black icky smoke comes um, to the top and comes down. And in this hallway, you can see, here's our, our soot and here's that cool, clean air still down here. You can see where it remained clear. Now, fire spreads by heat, not necessarily flames. Flames can stay in the room, but it's the heat in the black icky smoke that spreads through the home and it's the heat that spreads the fire. All you need is the hole the size of a pencil to spread that heat and cause that fire to spread. That's why firefighters have to pull walls and ceilings. All right, Kelly, okay. so as we head down the hallway, I just want to point out, you know, this door here is the example of all the doors we have in the house, and this is a hollow core door. Yes. Right, nothing special. It's, it's, it's basically a couple layers of wood and a little bit of cardboard in the center for structure, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and here it is. Yep, and what we're looking at is, again, that hot black icky smoke was up here, that heat. And it took, you know, it damaged the top part of the door. But if you look down, again, this is where we crawl low. This is where there's no damage. It stayed cool down here. Okay, as we go down, this would have been their office. And uh, the fire got into this room through the window, as I remember correctly. And you can see they have the same hollow core door here, but it's been consumed all the way down. Right, because the fire came from this direction, so there was more hot black icky smoke, and of course, more of the door is gone. Okay. Yeah. And as, as we continue down, we get towards the primary bedroom of the home, and this also had a hollow core door that was open. I mean, see your lines here as well. And this is where I think the fire first got into um, the house, basically. And, and there's, there's mm -hmm. a really interesting closet door at the end of this room. Yes, and again, most of the door's gone. So now let's look in the closet. This door was closed during the fire. Now we walk inside, we can see. You can tell that that's an ironing board. You can tell that there's clothing here. You can see a walker. You can see a speaker. Right here was a wardrobe. Clothes were hanging in this portable wardrobe. You can't even tell what some of this stuff is. A closed door will keep that hot black icky smoke out of a room for 10 to 20 minutes. So that's why we tell people we want them to close when they doze. So before you go to sleep at night, we want you to close that door. Or before you go on vacation, walk through your house and close all those doors because this is going to protect that room. It's gonna prevent fire spread from going in the rooms. It's breathable air, it's cool. You can survive in this room for a long period of time. Once I bring the people that lived in the home back in the home and show them around. They are, again, they're devastated and they don't realize that the extent of the damage and how much stuff is actually covered with this black oily film 
and and they want to take things home with them. Um, they they you know the kids want to grab a stuffed animal. Um, they want to nice grab a hat. They want to grab a piece of clothing. They want to take something home with them. But everything has that that oily film that I'll talk more about, and it has that smell. And just something this size, you bring it to your hotel room, you bring it to where you're staying overnight, and it will smell up the whole living space. It'll make everything smell. Sure. Well, and the other thing that we see here a lot, um, and we have a thing over here is we've got canned foods, we've got you know peanuts and things like that. I mean, they're all sealed. This may still even have the little vacuum seal on it. We'll say medications and things like that as well, but you shouldn't be taking those things, consuming them, cleaning them off, and, and you know bringing them with you because you know the heat and the smoke, it's toxic, right? Right. So when that hot black icky smoke goes up, it is hot very hot and it's black and it's toxic and it banks down. What people don't realize, our daily lives are full of things made out of petroleum. The paint on the walls, the wallpaper, our clothing. Basically everything we use is have some kind of petroleum base in them. And it's okay when it's in normal conditions, but when it's heated up, it burns and it burns this um, and creates this oily film, this almost soot that you can feel in your hand, and that covers everything. And people also don't realize that this soot is cancerous. There's carcinogens in this. There's different things that are toxic that you can't breathe, and that's why it's so important you get out and stay out in under three minutes. And that's what you see, this coating of all this stuff is toxic. That's why Mike and I are wearing gloves. Sure. So even if you could clean it, you shouldn't. Don't even use risk it because it. it was also probably heated up. Okay, Kelly. So here we are back in the entryway, right? This is where the family had their way to get out of the home. So we learned a lot of few things today, right? We've learned about a single hollow core door can save your life. It can it can prevent uh, and buy you some time and things like that. What are some of the more finer points about you know early warning and and notifying your family about a fire that may be going on? I know when I was a kid, I was told I had you know seven to ten minutes to get out of the home if I heard the fire alarm go off, things like that. You know, we all learned stop, drop, and roll. You know, what are, what are some of the things that have changed that we need to know about? Well, the big change has been it's no longer seven to 10 minutes, it's three minutes to get out. And that has a lot to do with, again, the things we talked about, how the contents of our home are not really natural fibers anymore, like wool and cotton. We're dealing with a lot of petroleum pot products that burn a lot hotter and burn a lot faster. And Different homes, newer homes, are made out of different construction, and that construction fails a lot sooner. And it's not that the whole, your new home isn't good and solid, but under fire conditions, that changes. So we tell people they have to be out in three minutes. And the only way you can get out in three minutes is to have early warning and to practice. So early warning means having a smoke alarm. Now, right now I have a carbon monoxide um, alarm in my hand, but you want to have smoke alarms. And you want to have them in the right places. So you want to have them on every level of the home, outside sleeping areas and inside sleeping areas and areas where people sleep. People don't realize if grandpa falls asleep in the living room every night, that's an area where people sleep and you have to have a working smoke alarm there. That means buy one with the 10 year lithium battery and make sure you test it once a month to make sure it is still working. Then you also want to practice your plan. Now, the kids, your kids in school, do they practice a fire drill? They do. Yeah, and I bet your kids can come home and tell you exactly um, they lined up at the door where their meeting place is, the hallway they walked down, and they probably can tell you that the whole school got evacuated in three minutes. Well, if a whole school can practice and evacuate in three minutes, so can anybody in a home, but you've got to practice your plan. Absolutely. So we have to practice. So you, families have to practice their plans. Now, schools do it five, five times a year. Families should actually be doing it once a month. And again, you have your smoke alarms that will warn you. You can get out in that three minutes. So you won't have to find your second way out. You won't have to worry about being behind a closed door and having an atmosphere that you can live in until you can get out another way. So that's how you make sure your family can get out, stay out, and be out in three minutes. That's fast. It is. That is really fast. What is the average response time then for a fire department or a volunteer fire department in your community? Is it, is it that three minutes? Well, so we tell people that they have to be out in the driveway or outside of their house watching the fire department actually arrive. They should be out by the time that the fire department arrives. Now, you and I, growing up, 
the fire department came in a lot of time and was able to rescue people because you had seven minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, but that's not the case now. You should actually be outside before that fire department arrives, regardless if they're full-time, paid on call, or volunteer. Okay, Kelly, so here we are down in the garage of the house, and this is below both bedrooms, and this is where the fire started. So currently the source of the fire is a little bit undetermined, but basically, you know, everything in this room was completely consumed, and uh, because there was a fire door, where we're looking right here was pretty much stopped right there. The fire door did its job. Fire door did its job, right? That's why there's yeah. codes. And then it had to work its way out and up. And that's um, how it got inside. And the, one of the you know homeowners here was actually behind that door sleeping and heard some crackling and things like that. Um, woke him up, didn't think much of it, went back to bed, and then smoke alarm went off. Oh, okay. Woke him up, got everybody, I think, out upstairs, mm -hmm. and uh, then had to wait for the fire department to arrive. Yes, and I believe that the fire upstairs uh, came from down here and went through the window, and that's how it got upstairs. Yep, that's correct. Came out, out the garage door, up, and broke the windows, mm -hmm. and then worked its way through. And as um, people can see, there's nothing salvageable in this room, and usually that's what happens in the room of origin, as we call it, is there's nothing salvageable. And um, the flames did spread upstairs, but the rest of the house that we saw really didn't have flames. It was all from that hot, black, icky smoke spreading. Yeah, and this is, you know, this, this garage has a lot of, you know, kind of your, your usual, we'll say kind of man cave kind of thing. We've got motorcycles, we've got all kinds of stuff in here. Um, you know, this could, be, this could be anyone's home, anyone's garage. Anyone's garage. And this was, this was just a, a typical Tuesday night kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, ended up changing their life for forever. Forever. This will be a pivotal moment in their family history. Yeah. So if people want more information about fire prevention, um, go to your local fire department or go to the state fire marshal's website and get more information. And at this point, I would like to thank you for taking time today to walk us through this house so people can see what a house actually looks like after a fire and not the Hollywood version of it. And um, I want to also thank the homeowner for letting us come into his house and film all of this. Absolutely. because. He, like us, his intention was to make sure that this does not happen to someone else. So people understand how devastating a fire can be. Because we are actually standing here months after this fire occurred. It is. And he will not be back in his home for probably... For months more. Months more. Yeah. So he's living out of a hotel. So please be proactive about fire prevention. Prevent the fire from happening in the first place. Know how to react by practicing a plan. And make sure that you have working smoke alarms in the right locations. Absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mike.